Hi everyone, Greg here. So I did a video a while ago about taking control of your terminal and that video did fairly well. I had a comment underneath there talking about keyboard input in C and so I thought in this one we'll explore that a little bit. So I have here some code written. This is a naive way, a naive way of getting some input in C. So I just use get character right and typically in an application terminal application the way you might imagine things to work out is you have a main loop you display some things and that could be a menu or you know the work area whatever it is you happen to be doing and then you wait on some input from the user and you keep doing that until a specific input is given like the letter X, just to exit out of that application. Right? So if, if we run this now and see what we get. And now I run this. By the way, I'm printing the content of C as a hexadecimal. Uh, that's just easier to think about it. So I'm, I'm going to type in some random letters like the letter D, the letter R. So what you notice is, first of all, I need to press enter for that, for that key press to even be registered and, and be available within my application. And this is something we're going to talk about in a minute. But I don't want to focus on that right now. I'm going to press escape and see what happens when escape is being pressed. I just get some nonsense here and then I get in hexadecimal 1b. So obviously this is not a printable character so you wouldn't necessarily expect this to look right but just bear in mind that 1b. So now let me press the up arrow key so I'm gonna press that and I get some nonsense here again and this time I get I get three bytes of input. I have a which is a is 10 in hexadecimal and this is basically the enter okay or the return key but I have three characters here but what's noteworthy is this is again starting with 1b okay I'm gonna press the function key function key 1 I'm gonna press function key 4 let's say and for any of those special characters it always begins with 1b so this is really a challenge is if you see if you see 1b what does that really mean does that mean that it is so the user pressed escape or does it mean that this is like the first byte within a sequence and if you think it might be the first byte within a sequence and you're waiting for the input how long do you wait how do you deal with that so what i would like to do is Take the library I wrote last time, which is tc.h, so tc for terminal control, and add some code there that deals with uh, processing the keyboard input very easily. So here I have my main.c, and then here, here I've added some code. So all of this code is the same code, mostly the same code you've seen already. Then here, additional code to handle keyboards, and there's this extra code here now so having a quick look at the terminal control library here most of this is the same that you may have seen in the previous video there's a couple of things different here you have additional code to handle keyboard input there's a little bit more than that that i have added you see here canon on and canon off what this does is it turns on or off the canonical mode canonical mode is basically when you type in your input and then you need to press the enter key the return key if you don't do that the uh, the application doesn't actually see the input the user typed in well this is known as canonical mode so you can turn this on or off so that as soon as you press the key the application becomes aware of that key press. You saw just a minute ago, I showed you this naive uh, application and I was I had to press enter all the time before the output 
or, or before the keyboard input would show up on the screen. So this is what we could do here to prevent that. We just turn canonical mode off. So here, whenever I do a library, when you see two letters or three letters as the prefix, this is part of the API. If you see only one letter as the prefix, this is not part of the API. This is to be used internally in the library, but it's not supposed to be called by the user of that library. So here, basically, you would call that function. You would pass on a callback. You can optionally pass on an extra variable. And then you'd be able to handle the keyboard input with all the special keys. And just in a second, we're going to see an example. And then after that, I'm going to go through the details of how it actually works. But this is the one function you need to use. Okay, so now if we have a look at the example application, I've used that function. TC init input. I've used the process key. This is the callback. This is the function that will deal with processing the input from the keyboard. I've turned off echo. So when you type something into the terminal with default terminal settings, whatever you type in shows up on the screen straight away. So this disables that. So you, that input doesn't show up. So the actual function that does process input, notice that now we have a 64 bit data type in order to accept our input because now we can have multi byte input. If X is pressed, we're just going to exit the, the application. So the, the echo is being turned on again. Canonical mode is turned back on. So the init input will turn it off automatically for you. So it's turned back on and then we we'll just exit. But here now you can see that we can easily handle the function keys F1 all the way. When I forgot the other thing. Uh, hold on, I just... I'm just going to fix that quickly. Okay, so if I press the function key one, it will just type, it will just output to the screen, pressed function key one. When you're not working within a GUI, but you are actually in a TTY, then you need a different, that there will be a different different sequence of bytes to represent F1. Why that is, I don't know. I suspect there are historical reasons for that, but so this is why we have this extra macro here with TTY. And by the way, all of those macros are defined here. And if you look carefully at how those macros are defined, you have 1B, 4F, 50. So this is the same sequence, the, the same sequence of bytes that we saw earlier with our naive application. So the function keys, then if you press the escape key, the arrow keys, what else do we have? Tab, insert, home, etc. So if we just compile that. So uh, what will I call it? Not so naive. Main that C and because I'm using threads, I do have to add this flag here. All right, and now, all right. So now, whenever I press something, I press the function key. Right there, you go. If I press escape, if I press the arrow keys, right, uh, any normal letter, tab, and so on and so forth. You see, this is all working. Right. And if I press X, then I get out of that. Okay, so that should make it much easier to write your applications and deal with this special kind of input. Okay, so now how does it work? Well, you see that this function returns a struct. There's a type def here for this struct. And it is basically terminal control input. That's what I called it. This main struct is defined here. It contains an array and it stores the callback that you're going to be using then to process your input. The array, what does it contain? It contains the time and it contains the character C. So when you call this function, what does it do? 
a malloc for the main struct. It does initialize everything to zero. It turns off the cannon. It makes sure that the callbacks that you passed on that it gets stored within that data structure, and then it starts to process these in separate threads. So if we have a look at this one first, what did this one do? So I've been thinking, how can you distinguish the different keys that are being typed in? Because as we saw from our naive application, if you press in, or oh, was, was it the F1 key? I think it was the F1 key. Basically, you get three bytes. One is the escape, and then in, I think it's capital O and capital P. It doesn't really matter what it is exactly, but how can you tell the difference between the user typing in escape and then O and then P or simply typing in the F1 key? Well, the only real difference is time, right? So when those three or four bytes come in and those bytes come in within 100,000 nanoseconds of each other, then you know that no human could have typed that in so fast. So you know that those sequences basically belong together. So any two bytes that come in within 100,000 nanoseconds of each other, those are two bytes that belong together. Uh, now I figured that out through trial and error. I don't know if there is any bit of documentation anywhere that tells you what the proper way is of doing things or whatever. I, I'm not sure. I just managed to make this work. And I'm not even sure if there's the proper way of doing it, but it is the way that I found that actually works. So what it is doing, it is reading standard input. It is reading one byte at a time. And it is storing it in this array it's storing that character C, whatever you type in, whatever those byte sequences are, it's storing it always in this dot C. And it is storing the time and monotonic time. What monotonic means is that this guarantees you that whatever, whatever the next time you're given, there will be a higher value than the previous time you're given. So even if somebody changes the clock on the system and puts the clock back or whatever, you're guaranteed that it's not necessarily going to give you the accurate time, but it's going to give you relative time, right? So the, the, the next time you get will be the correct increment of time relative to the last time that you called it. So that, that's basically what this monotonic time means. And so that is still stored in the array, but it's stored in the other part of that of the element of the array. And it just keeps doing that in a loop. So then the other process that so there were those two threads, that's the other function. What that will do is it will check as it goes through the array, it goes through the array in this infinite loop. It will it will check here if those bytes came in within 100,000 nanoseconds. And if they do, then it, it will treat those two bytes as the same, part of the same keystroke. So it will do a shift of eight bits and then it will add that character onto the key. And then eventually it will call the callback with that key, okay, with that key press. Uh, so you will have access to that code, you just have to check the GitLab, it is there as always. And that is basically how it works. Alright, so now I have a nice library which allows me not only to take control of the terminal, but also to deal with this more complex input in a nice way. And it's not just theoretical, let me just show you something I've written. I wanted an application a bit like less. So if I do that first, I can look at the code in less. And it looks rather boring and it's not really meant to look at code. So of course I could look at it in an editor, but what if I just want to explore a code base without making any changes to the code? So I've long wanted something like less, but specifically to look at code. So I 
wrote something cv so code viewer main.c add now this is the application i wrote and i can use the arrow keys to go up and down i can use page up and page down right uh, and so that's the application you've just seen the the code for this little application main.c and i'm looking at it in my own my own command basically right so if i press x i get out of that is i just type in cv and then main.c uh, i'm not going to show you the code for this in detail i will just give you like a sneak preview um cv process key so that's the callback for processing the keys and you see here arrow down and then the top line is like the first line that you see at top of the screen so with arrow down you go you go down one line with arrow up you go you 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 subtract one from the top line and then similar for page down and page up right so i might show you more in an upcoming video especially i would actually like colors uh, i would like to see highlights the same way that you would see it in an editor all those different colors i would like to implement that in code viewer that would be it's not going to be easy but it's certainly feasible and uh, i want to give that a shot in the future but for now uh this is a nice little command uh just like less but specifically to look at code and all it does differently now is it just puts those line numbers to the side uh, but definitely a starting point for something that might become a lot more in the future we'll see about that so let me know in the comments if you're interested in that if you are i might do a video about this in the future all right so that's all i wanted to say to you i hope you enjoyed this as always if you did enjoy it give me a like and a subscribe and thank you very much for watching